TE. So the New York Times, uh, they started talking about our presentation. Um, what's the first one? Billy, Billy Collins. Collins. Billy Collins. What do we do with Billy Collins? Visual right, and uh, Responding and authoring poetry with images. Responding and authoring poetry, uh, poetry with images. Who do we have? W.S. Merwin. We should have done this. Oh, yesterday. Merwin was the, the critical. <laughs> These are poets. Criti so critical um, response to um, how do we how do we talk about? It? We did eye movies, and the students responded to his poetry for um, important issues in environment and social justice, and um, made their own eye movies. Um, Thank you. Everything that mattered to them in their own lives. It was pretty amazing. And then this guy down here at the bottom Robert. is. Uh, Yay. <laughs> and what we did was last year we started thinking, um, with a lot of these, we started thinking about use of technology and authoring in response to their poetry um, with creating or uh, messing around with visual imagery. With Pinsky, we tried to do a pivot and say, let's just focus on the audio portion. So we started thinking about podcasting and audio podcasting and SoundCloud. Um, so this year, uh, we're taking a look at Natasha Trethway. Uh, the current poet laureate, and so instead of me okay, talking, nope. hold your finger on. There you go. We'll let Natasha speak for herself. Second, okay. You can go full screen if you want. Thanks. She's an amazing speaker. I guess she reads her own poetry. But I don't hear a sound. Are the speakers on? It is sending audio from here. Yeah. Hmm. She's incredible because she reads with such vigor. Yeah. But you can't hear. No, we need to. <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to. Go straight. Yeah. Go straight, please. I'm doing it right now. Never figure that out. So once again, this program is brought to you by Emory University. Liturgy. To the security guard staring at the gulf, thinking of bodies washed away from the coast, plugging her ears against the bells and sirens, sound of alarm, the gaming floor on the coast. To Billy Scarpetta, waiting tables on the coast, staring at the gulf, thinking of water rising, thinking of New Orleans, thinking of cleansing the coast. To the woman dreaming of returning to the coast, thinking of water rising, her daughter's grave, my mother's grave, underwater on the coast. To Miss Mary, somewhere. To the displaced living in trailers along the coast, beside the highway, in vacant lots and open fields, to everyone who stayed on the coast, who came back or cannot to the coast, to those who died on the coast. This is a memory of the coast, to each his own recollections, her reclamations, their restorations, the return of the coast. This is a time capsule for the coast. Words of the people don't forget us. The sound of wind, waves, the silence of graves, the muffled voice of history, bulldozed and buried under sand, poured on the eroding coast, the concrete slabs of rebuilding the coast. This is a love letter to the Gulf Coast, a praise song, a dirge, invocation and benediction, a requiem for the Gulf Coast. This cannot rebuild the coast. It is an indictment, a complaint, my logos, argument and discourse with the coast. This is my nostos, my pilgrimage to the coast, my memory, my reckoning, native daughter, I am the Gulf Coast. The proceeding. So what we wanted to do is, uh, once again, work with the uh, poet laureate and her works and then figure out ways that we can authentically, effectively bring technology into these uh, pieces of text. You want me to be Vanna? Sure. <laughs> so where do we get our ideas? Well, as we said, this has been now our, hard to believe, we're on our sixth year of exploring poet laureates with 
technology. Um, and so our theories and framing really come from that kind of multi-mode perspective in that sense that we're designing and redesigning images and words of other poets. Um, and the idea that having, when we create responses and poetry where our students have to select and choose images that represent the poems and moods that they can get poems that other authors have made, or think about the poems and authors and mentor texts and how each word changes the meaning, is really what we're trying to get at. So you. So, but when we when we decided to focus on the poet laureate, this idea of documentary poetry really hit us. This idea that we want to find, um, Trethewey speaks about finding lost voices in history. And for the students that we work with, they so often are marginalized voices. And I think for when I speak for everybody here up on the panelists, that's what we want to do. Instead of trying to control voices in school, we're trying to encourage voice in school. Mm -hmm. And we thought documentary poetry would be a way to really do that, to have them look at imagery and capture some essence, some part of either history or documenting their own life kind of through autobiography poems. Um, so when that's what Treadway speaks of, the document, documentary poetry, this idea that what we're talking about is giving voice to the groups of individuals that memory, that time is forgotten. And you heard that in her poem. We're just speaking of, as a coast, you know, giving kind of a personification. This was, you know, that was the coast coming back and saying, um, I was a forgotten voice. <coughs> but I love this quote from her, too. And this is something we talk about with energy. I mean, how do most teachers teach poetry? It, it sickens me. It's like, mm -hmm. all right, we're doing our scattering hunt now. I need three poems of the metaphor, two poems of the imagery. And we never spend any time with poems. We're only looking for, like, devices. And kids know how to do that. They call broccoli trees. Not me. Why? Because they think through imagery. We as adults, certainly says, we forget that. And we're trying to reinforce in the kids what they already do. And we're beginning, like, imagery is just, you know, it's, it's paintings, it's, it's music, it's everything. That's poetry. Um, so? Before we get to the elegy for the Native Gardens, which is the poem that we do have out in the one that um, you heard Natasha Tucker reading that you are familiar with her work, um, the, the, the marginalized voice there, does anybody know who it is or what it is that was going on with Keanu Katrina? I know it's, I'll help, I'll help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, what she was speaking to, she's from Gulfport, Mississippi, and she was talking about how after Katrina, only New Orleans was in the news, in the news and in the, in, the, in the care and the help and the relief, and everybody forgot about Mississippi. So that's really what the first marginalized voice we talk about. In this one, um, I'll read this for you, and you have a copy in front of you, um, because we'll, we'll do something quickly with it. This is, listen for another marginalized voice or two. We leave Gulfport at noon, gulls overhead trailing the boat, streamers, noisy fanfare, all the way to Ship Island. What we see first is the fort, its roof of grass, a lee, half reminder of the men who served there, a weathered monument to some of the dead. Inside we follow the ranger, hurried though we were to get to the beach. He tells of graves lost in the gulf, the island split in half when Hurricane Camille hit, shows us casements, cannons, the store that sells souvenirs, tokens of history long buried. The Daughters of the Confederacy has placed a plaque here at the fort's entrance. Each Confederate soldier's name raised hard in bronze. No names carved for the Native Guards, Second Regiment, Union Men, Black Phalanx. What is monument to their legacy? All the grave markers, all the crude headstones, water loss. Now fish dart among their bones, and we listen for what the waves intone. Only the fort remains, near 40 feet high, round, unfinished, half open to the sky, the elements, wind, rain, God's deliberate eye. Chathway talks about um, giving voice to who is blotted out in memory. And if you want to take a minute, we're just going to take a minute because we can't wait to get to Leanne's students and their voices. But you feel like you could just look at the poem in front of you. Um, that's what I just read to you. Does anybody know about the Native Guard? Look quickly and see if you can get a sense of who is missing, who needs to be brought to light. 
through Chuck Wade's documentary poetry and maybe specific words, phrases, images that capture those voices? Feel free to talk to the person next to you, find out who made your garden if you don't know. Okay, I'm going to cut in just for the sake of time. Um, what words, phrases, images, or, or standards capture the most the emotions of the, of the voices that are unheard? But first, who are the voices that are unheard? What do you, what do you know about this topic? What are you finding out from each other? Who are the native guard? The union men. The union men. The union American soldiers who fought for the union. Perfect. African American soldiers who fought for the union. Um, were they um, memorialized in the same way that others were? Obviously, no. What what word did you did you circle? Talk what what word did you underline? What made you notice that? What's the imagery? Yep. Uh, no names carved. No names carved. What else? Thank you. So that water loss, the water loss, and the bones of the fish. Yes. Black barons. Black barons, right? And what else? Unfinished half of the Okay, I'm going to tap open to the sky and I'm going to cut in here and remind you that with Natasha Trekway, she's always talking on two levels. She's not just talking about history, but she's talking about her personal life. And if you don't know her personal life, you do know her personal life. Tell us what the half might mean. She uses the word half often. Her right. mother was overwhelmed in loss of life right. and got married uh, when it was not legal in the state of Mississippi. Yep, 1966, it was not legal to have inter interracial marriages. So everywhere woven into her documentary poetry, and this is where we'll sort of end, is the notion of the marginalized voices in the past, the half, the half, the split, the island was split in half. Um, the, the Hurricane Camille came, this is not Katrina now, but Hurricane Camille came, and she also manages to weave in her own life of three half. And um, she talks about her mother and her father in so many of her poems. So those of you who are experts, you'll see that throughout her books. We do have three of her books. I'm just going to place them on your tables um, so you can take a look at them. And we're going to just move on. So you want to do this in your classroom. Um, it was actually, we've done this for a lot of experimentation. Like any good lesson, um, I tell my pre service teachers, you know, good teachers are really creative. Um, great teachers steal from the good. Um, mm -hmm. That way they have time left in life. Um, so. <laughs> We still steal from each other. We steal from ideas from all over the place. Um, so how could you steal from us to do this in your classroom? Well, first is we gave them these two poems to read. That we've worked on, we heard uh, the poet read, and then we read one together. And we use that same exact prompt with our students that we see in the turn and talk. Um, one of the things that we've done is then have an annotated poem. And we kind of call this purposeful coding, not simply highlighting the idea that we're reading with a purpose in mind. And we focus in on things like mo uh, mood, tone, looking for very specific phrases that change the author's meaning. Um, and anybody who's familiar with common course and standards right now know that's kind of a really big push, looking at specific words and how that affects an author's meaning, um, especially when you read the author's craft strands. Um, then we had our students, or some of them, cho choose it in a a historical event, either in their life or in history, um, and locate a primary document from that moment. Um, and this is how I envision bringing more informational text into the English language curriculum. Is I basically, I don't make it a new unit. I just take what I already do well and integrate it. So for example, we had them find an event in, in history, and they could use that. Um, they annotated that document, looking for those lost voices, and then being an English teacher, I could not give them the graphic organizer in my head of this clue. Um, so uh, we created a little organizer for them that we each changed and modified using our own way. Wrote, they wrote their poems, and then we uploaded them to SoundCloud. Anybody familiar with SoundCloud at all? Yeah, this is, it's basically 
a social network for sound. Um, and you can find music, poets up there. So what was great is I worked with seventh graders and pre-service teachers. Uh, my seventh graders were New Haven, Leanne's students were seniors in Hartford, and were able, they were able to share each other's work and look at them um, through a different tone. Yeah, I mean, SoundCloud's an online social network for audio, but part of the challenge is that there, it's an online social network for audio. So there are, you know, Scholastic has study guides and there are poems that are being read aloud on there, but there's also, um, you know, artists release music. So there is a lot of, uh, and, you know, not safe for school content on there. Uh, we do have resources to protect yourself and your students, but it's a great tool. So let's look at a few examples from the classroom. For, um, so again, like I said, we, we've done this project this, to me, is the, the cornerstone of a great poetry project. When I do the same project in kindergarten, all mm -hmm. the way to my pre service teachers. Mm -hmm. And each one of these projects every year, we do multiple grade levels. I, did, I worked with seventh graders, um, which you see there in the images. They're part of a Giro grant. Um, so they came to our summer academy. Um, Leanne worked with 12th graders um, with the school. And then Sue and I also did this project with pre service teachers. So that, to me, when it works at that level, I love it. So this is one of an example from one of my students. They, I think they did a, they did theirs on the student, I think, on 9-11. Mm -hmm. So what were these students doing primary schools? They annotated, I'll show you an example in the next slide. Tears that have left a mark by Odette Bennett. Cleaning, cooking, taking care of her one and only baby, hearing the sirens on the news, breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. She's in front of the TV, her eyes too shocked to cry, but the tears fall out either way. All she can see is the twin towers falling and falling and just falling to landing on innocent people, innocent workers, innocent children. All she can hear is screaming. That's all, just screaming. Nothing else, not her baby crying, not her husband rushing through the door, not the phone ringing. All she can feel is a vibration through her body, through her veins, her heart pumping through her chest so hard you can hear it a mile away. She can taste her salty tears that cannot stop and won't stop flowing. All she can touch the TV screen that shows everyone running, screaming, crying, and dying. All she knows is she can't do anything because she is miles away from her home. Her life is now a blur. Beer bottles, dirty clothes, and icy kitchen filled with rats. No longer a man to help, to help guide her, pay the house, or show her unconditional love. But that's all over. Now it's her one and only baby cleaning up her mother's tears that have left a mark. And so the other students, we use Google Plus for our okay. care camp, and other students had links to that, okay. and they could, um, yeah. they can now go in and comment on her poem. And so we had students from all over Connecticut commenting on these like poems, which was a powerful tool. Two of them were fine. Okay. So it was slightly, I think, it was out of the, this is the uh, practical organizer. Um, so in this character, identify the mood or plight of your character, connect to the historical event. And words or phrases, uh, sources from your primary document. So that's what they were doing. I think that slide just got out of order. Um, here's an example of one of the annotated texts. They had a color code where they, you know, each color was something different, and they put in their comments right there on the feature. Um, and this was one of my pre-service teachers. Um, so that was something that you know, seventh graders, they're not, they they need some instruction in annotating text. Um, what you know, tools do you use to uh, annotate text? This was just in preview or Adobe Reader. On iMac, on Macs, I use new, um, on, I mainly I use color pencils. But if I, <laughs> if I have like technology, I will use PDF Zen on Chromebooks. I use, um, this is preview on Macs. And on the laptops, uh, or on the iPads, I use uh, NU Annotate or Notability. And so this is a copy of the student's graphic organizer. So they, here they have their details from the event from that they got from their primary document, and then words or phrases that they really wanted to hone in on in their poem. I'm going to click the sound. Yes. And create the sequence. Mm -hmm. Full scale offensive. Not half scale. Not even three quarters. No quarter. That's what it is more than just a skirmish. The seventh fleet, fleet of sail, churning down the strait, straight towards what? Commitment? Oh, 
yes, and more, committed to hold that sacred line, the 38th, where the third phase froze my blood and the fifth phase froze the war. Stalemate. A battle fought not against the PVA, the KPA, but time itself, the enemy of all men. Notice so many hours and days, days into years, Chinese New Year, Chinese Spring. Old Baldy's white pate, dyed red, Stalin's flag for all to see. Fifty-three at the thirty-eighth, the brass gleams in my hand, the last one, the last one, shining like the noonday sun. I breathe air unclouded by gun smoke, and I begin to cry. And so now Leanne's going to show you some of her examples from the classroom. Yes. Um, primary sources, do you give primary sources? Um, with the seventh graders, I did. Um, mainly, I was also under a very short time constraint, but it was a one month summer camp that started in Europe. So we, we, we geared them with, and they needed for your scrap, 12 or 13. Um, with my pre service teachers, you know, they had to go and, and find their own primary sources. And that was a collaboration between an English pre service teacher and a social studies pre service teacher. All right, so um, before we get to my seniors, um, we're going to listen to one of your graduate mm -hmm. students. So uh, when I introduced this project to them, I told them, you know, the, the, um, the entire idea that we'd have a real audience, an authentic audience, and that I'd be taking it with me to Boston. Um, and they were interested in that, but they, they weren't all that interested in poetry. So we started with some examples. And um, the, the poem you heard before by Greg's student, um, Tears that leave a mark, I believe it was called. Yes. We listened to that, and they were impressed. And I said, "This is a seventh grader," and then they were, they were a little intimidated, but they challenged. Um, and then we listened to the poem you're about to hear right now, um, which was written by two pre-service teachers. It was, and you can see they use the graphic organizer differently, just because that's what pre-service teachers do. Yeah, <laughs> they modify okay. things. Yes, yes. exactly. So um, it was it was really lovely because after we listened to both, there was kind of a silence, and it occurred to me that my students were directly between in age the seventh graders and these pre-service students, and so they uh, they kind of that resonated with all of us, and it was it was kind of our entrance really before we even began. So. You don't have to play the whole thing of this, even. Yeah, this one's a long one, but if we get, get the feel. Coping, Hoping by Julian Steve. I am a German. I am a Jew. I have given my life to this culture, but my country has turned its back to me. And so I will bear witness to what is to come. I am marginalized, persecuted, Deported. My choice? Go on working. Get drunk on work. So we go eking out a bare existence and go on hoping. Go on coping. I have borne witness to the horrors of war. And I ask you these questions. Is the eternal truth man's fighting soul? Was man made stupid to see his own stupidity? What is gained from the senseless destruction of humanity? And so one of the things there is that annotated piece. So you notice as we played through. What? My choice? Go on working. Get drunk on work. And then the comments are down below. So the kids could mark up the audio clip. How did you have them do that? I did that. You part. did that? I actually asked my pre-service um, teachers that part of their assignment was to go and comment on each other. So I just got the social networking happening. Obviously, the pre-service teachers, they were able to go home and do it on their own and have access, and there wasn't an issue, which, of course, Leanne has different um, uh, limitations. But it's nice to know what it really can do. Did you give them any guidance before they went in and mark up, like I what said, to look for? Um, I don't think so. I think they had to comment on two different poems and then you know, read what other people had. But the fun part is that they do it at specific space mm -hmm. places along the poem so that it, theoretically, one can then go back and rethink how they want their poem and re, um, rewrite it, essentially, by re-recording, if they get some good comments and some good thoughts. 
from others. That's so it, really it really is very sophisticated technology for that reason because you almost are, it's almost the same concept of, of a, as a hyperlink. So you are able to stop at a moment in time and the students are commenting on each other and it's just so much more in their world. I mean, I was, I'm was i still gaining facility with this, um, but they were familiar with it before I was. Um, so it's, it's an engaging tool for that reason. Um, so this, I'm not sure. It was mine also. Um, this, well, this was just another um, example that you used where you can just see um, who they pick for the, for the character. It, it was the Edward Snowden WikiLeaks whole deal. Mm -hmm. And um, so anything can be up to uh, very, very current. And yet, there, so the notion of primary source can not just be old stuff from history, but can be, you know, whatever's going on right now. The Plight of the Whistleblower by Mark Bilodeau and Andrew Sparta. Don't hear those names. You didn't get them. I am a stranger <laughs> in a strange land, a prisoner without a cell. I only wish to bring the truth to light, but my intentions have brought me hell. My country keeps citizens in the dark and spies for their protection. It keeps them distracted and mollified with televised misdirection. My freedom and safety are under threat, an ominous government epithet. Declare that I am an entrusted spy and pose a national security threat. So again, um, just, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but this is a marginalized voice. This is, this is how it feels to be the whistleblower. So again, it was all inspired and leads back to, or draws back to Trathway, and that we were listening for that marginalized voice, which is kind of a, a, a stretch, but quite amazing what they came up with. Okay, so when I started, I, um, I, we were coming off of a long and arduous unit um, on, well, no, the unit was great, but we, we had just finished college essays, and um, it was very difficult for them, even though it's a personal voice, the structure of an essay, even in a room, I have a range um, of fifth grade reading level all the way up to 12th grade. We no longer have homogeneous grouping. We have heterogeneous, and there's some very wonderful benefits to that. But when you are teaching something as objective <laughs> as writing, it's very difficult. So we were all kind of tired. Um, and I, I was looking forward to this because of the conference. But I was also looking forward to a break and, a, and an opportunity to just kind of bond with them again um, instead of giving them comments on their essays that they weren't pleased with. So, um, but I did, we are very objectives-based and results-driven because we have to be because I work in a very difficult district where I'm being monitored. So I had to think about what my goals were for them. Um, so academically, I just wanted them to write a poem, all of them to write a poem, um, become familiar and comfortable with the process of drafting. Um, I wanted to use this to inform our later drafts because many of my students believe that when they have just written something, even if it's a paragraph, they've arrived, you know, <laughs> and they don't want to go back, they don't want to look at it, and it's insulting to them um, when I ask them to do that. So I, I thought that this would be sort of an entrance um, into the process of drafting that would help us later on when we get to di more difficult writing. Um, develop self-sufficiency with regard to editing. Um, I did not touch their poems unless they came to me individually on their own time um, until the final version. And I just gave them the things I was looking for and they had to keep changing it, which really pushed them. Um, I was nervous to do that because uh, in this district there's a lot of teacher reliance, but they really came through. So um, that was something I learned, that they were able to do that. Master figurative language with poetic and the poetics of repetition and internal rhyme and demonstrate higher order thinking skills with poetry. Um, and then I just was very interested in developing compassion or examining their lack of. Um, I'll get more into that later. Um, and of course, just the world outside themselves and their own personal experience. So relating themselves to something that's happened in history or is happening now, um, considering the power of bearing witness and using words effectively to expose and document what is going on. All right, so we started, I was not familiar with Trethway, so we started with somebody I was familiar with until I could gain the facility that I needed to gain to be able to present it to the students. So we started with um, The Colonel by Carolyn Porsche, and um, they got pretty into it. We all learned about the El Salvadorian Civil War in the 70s and 80s <laughs> through this poem, and <coughs> sort of as we entered into that, um, we uh, sort of, it was a good confrontation of what, of how poetry can present an event outside of a news report or an essay or an opinion piece. 
um, how it sort of slid past all the defenses and um, really allowed them to understand. So we focused, I, unfortunately I don't have the poem and we don't have time to get into all the pieces I use as mentor text, but um, we did focus on the steps of writing documentary poetry. So we decided credibility was important, concrete details, and juxtaposition. So we learned what all of those meant. Um, then we looked at imagery and how imagery and figurative language can actually establish tone and what tone is. Um, and they actually got into that. Um, they liked that a lot. And then metaphor and simile, of course, and um, having a powerful closing line. Do you have a question? What, what, do, you mean, what do you mean by juxtaposition? Um, the contrast. So oh, the contrast. If, if you want to go back quickly to that. So one of the things we talked about at the beginning of the year, which sort of supported this unit, was the power of words um, and the power of image. So we were sort of thinking about that already. But um, if you could go back one more. OK, so it starts out so, so nicely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Daily papers, pet dogs, a pistol on the cushion beside him. And that was shocking to my students. They were like, what? And then they thought, the later on, there's something about disembodied body ears and atrocities of war, and they thought it was metaphorical, which was really interesting um, to pull back from that and look at the reality of it. So um, she just she hits all of those points. So if you ever are teaching documentary poetry or anything, I've used this piece for everything. Um, it's very powerful. Okay, thank you. I just could um, pass this one. We, yeah, you can pass this one. Okay, so after reading that, we kind of together created a six-step process because my students were interested. I was sort of getting buy-in with the idea of creating their own poems, but um, they, they, they need a formula, um, which I did not want to give them. I didn't want to say, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. But what we did do is we heavily annotated the um, Forche poem, the Carolyn Forche poem, The Colonel, and we pulled out these six things that she did in order so that they had a recipe rather than a formula if they needed to rely on something like that. So establishing credibility, using concrete details to begin to tell a story, using imagery and figurative language to express tone, returning to the concrete details so you don't lose your place in the story, um, weaving figurative language and imagery through the con concrete details to continue to express tone, and then ending with a, a really strong closing line that brings the two together. This is in Google Presenter. Uh, so we will send this out on our blogs, but also send it out through Twitter uh, so you don't feel like you have to grab everything. You'll have all the SoundCloud uh, links as well. We're recording video too, so we'll share the whole lecture. All right, so then um, we needed to decide what we were going to document. So as a full class, um, we just brainstormed events that had happened in our lifetime, and it was very difficult at first because they were like, oh, nothing's ever happened. And I was like, well... Where were you sitting on December 12th last year when Sandy Hook happened? And that opened up the world to them. They remembered. And I happened to have been their age when 9-11 happened. I was a senior in high school. So I shared that experience with them. Um, and that was our entrance. Uh, so we brainstormed um, as a class. And then we put key events on the wall. So we would have it to look back at if we needed to. And this is a graphic organizer. It was extremely simple. I really personally dislike making worksheets. Not because I'm opposed to them, but I, per I don't enjoy spending time on Word making worksheets. <laughs> so what we took was a larger blank piece of paper, folded it into three, and we named these, these three parts. So the kids made their own. Um, and that just worked a lot. It was more authentic. Um, so then we started, we, we zeroed in on one topic they wanted to write about that they could anchor themselves in. So something they had credibility in because they were there. So a lot of them chose Sandy Hook because it was the most recent. Some of them chose 9-11, I think. I think about, I think they were about five or six when that happened, but some of them remembered. Um, and I told them that these were practice poems, which they weren't all that happy about, but then, then they got into it because they got into writing the poems. So I said, these are not your final poems. This is your first, that you're finding your voice. So choose something you're comfortable with um, because we will continue writing. Um, then we discuss relevant content and what that means. Um, and we discuss the purpose of documentary poems. So at this point, once they had started a draft and they had something they could look at that was their own, um, we really started getting into what, what power does documentary poetry um, hold. Um, and at this point, we just, before the college essays, we had done a unit on education and the value of it and what it means. And uh, we talked about how um, 
in many third world countries, there, uh, especially where education costs money, um, there are children who are given two orphanages that are actually just fronts for child trafficking. And I actually met a woman this summer who is heavily invested in that. So that was sort of, I, I introduced that as a topic they could write about that's happening now that they could expose. And that kind of set a lot of them on fire. OK, then we got to Treadway. After all of this, they had a draft. They had a facility with poetry. They had confidence. So we took on um, a, a harder poem and a longer poem. Um, and this is where I introduced repetition and eternal rhyme. So two more tools, two more poetic tools they could use to make their, their poems seem like poems. Um, I'm not going to read all of this. You can switch, but that'll be, well, all of this will be up there. And then we came up with a rubric together. So we decided establishing credibility, as we already spoken about, was important, using concrete details and juxtaposition, three similes or metaphors, to finish with a powerful line, and either repetition or internal rhyme at least three times. Um, I am always hesitant to grade poetry, but as I made an assignment, I, I had to come up with a fair and objective way of doing so. So I made it very clear that they were not being graded on whether or not their poem could be published in you know, The New Yorker, but rather on it, how well they had approached it and, and how well they had met the requirements of this particular assignment. So it was an assignment, and um, there was very little objection, because at this point, they had already done most of it. So the rubric came out of the work we were doing. OK, so these are the results. Um, this poem, I'm just going to uh, preface this with uh, her. She, this, this student just moved from Ghana four months ago. Her accent is extremely heavy. Um, it's beautiful, but it's hard to hear. So um, all of these are up on SoundCloud, and I'm going to put the actual um, text of it up as well, if anybody's interested. Victim. I have been a victim by chance. Helpless, I watched. An idol. Hilton said, Victim. I have been a victim by chance. Helpless, I watched. An idol town server. Leave me stranded. On the ticket of Uncle's inheritance. I have been a victim of indifference. Once my father departed. Custom cast me adrift, but in my knapsack, I carried a two of Faraday to cry about my way. I have seen the smile of pain once my father was no more. I have seen Custom cut off my mother from the very cocoa farms that colors her sweet soft palms. My mother cut off from the very mane that frees her youth and brow. This robot called Tribe, where is your head? Where the dickens are your bloody guts? Okay, so just a little word on that. She said, Hello, Sarah, I'm not school with oh, I like it here. With everyone. Make it stop. <laughs> um, she, she approached me and she said, uh, I don't want to document any of the things you talked about. I want to talk about my culture. And I said, Sure, <laughs> that sounds fabulous. And so she was talking about um, a custom that is still practiced um, in some tribes, not hers. Um, where the next male relative in, inherits everything from a deceased male relative um, and often then cuts off the daughters and wife of that man from, um, from their inheritance and makes them completely defenseless. And she just was outraged by that and she wanted to, she wanted to bear witness. Um, and so the last lines, I don't know if you could hear them, but she said, this robot called tribe, where is your logic, or where are your bloody guts? It, it just was, she was wonderful. OK, and then a lot of students, as I spoke about before, chose to write about Sandy Hook because it was so fresh in their minds. Um, but this one particular student really just, it wasn't resonating with her. And she said, I just don't care. <laughs> and um, she, on her own, chose to investigate why everybody else was having an emotional reaction and she was not. Um, and the result is. Very powerful. It was at night and I was watching the news because my dad had told me to. He said something very important was happening, so I needed to watch it. I watched until I saw what this something important was. After, in my mind, it was like rubbish. There were many things going through, through my head 
very disorganized, so I organized it. And I soon finalized my thoughts on the event, which was this. La, 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 la. See, I told you I remembered. I was there. I saw it through the glass imagery. There was laughter that came with hope, entrances that were deceiving. Oh, shut up. You just heard them talk. You just saw the naked moon playing an unfamiliar game of hide-and-go-seek, and you got scared. You were scared, weren't you? Was not. The moon was fairly so. I remembered the light on my bare cheek. There was a noise, not of the lady's voice, but something louder. A noise no anyone could see, feel, and hear. And they were gone. Gone like the wind. And gone was El, loco hombre. It was a great movie. The saddest and most frightening horror. And Oscar, if you'd ask me, he'd win for killing the little ones. And then they went to arrest the bastard. They end. So what? People die. Get over it. I don't see why people make such a big deal out of this. Dying. We all know this is the world we did not choose to live in. We all know where people like him go. And we certainly all know it's coming again soon. Just wait on it. And I guess I'm sad. What other emotions are there to feel? Well, there's anger. But what good would that do? They're dead. Then I came back to life and realized that from my other poems, both angels and demons die. Yeah, and uh, this is a, a girl who has often had difficulty uh, connecting emotionally, and um, she has identified the strains in herself that have cut her off from that in that poem. So that was exciting to see. Okay, so this student uh, created a character in her poem um, to expose the atrocities around child trafficking. She, she, when we were talking about the Haitian children, there was a picture of a little girl who had gone missing, um, was sold from an orphanage, and the, the parents, often these children are not orphans, like I said before, the parents give them up. So the parents were trying to locate this girl, and she's just beautiful, and she has these big eyes full of light, and um, this, this student really connected to it. But we had no information about her, so she created a voice for her. Oh, and I wanted, there's a little interview at the beginning because I wanted to hear about her process, so I hope you can hear it. It sounds a little okay. odd. Okay, so, um, Carolyn, you um, created a character for your documentary poem. You're documenting something that commonly happens, but you weren't referring to a real person. So what inspired you to create this character? Um, seeing a documentary or a review of a young girl that looked in pain and was kidnapped and put to the scene and I knew that she was. So in a way, I was writing like either she was dead or alive, but I'm still trying to make it seem like she's trying to send a message to the ones that could hear her. Okay, so because you didn't know very much about her, you sort of wanted to become her voice, but you created the character because you didn't know enough about the right. missing girl. Excellent, okay. And then you mentioned other characters, uh, a young boy, um, children who are without parents, so um, what is the main message that you want people to take away from your documentary poem? Like, what are you trying to expose? Um, what I'm trying to expose is that I want them to know to, in unity, like I said in the poem, we can make a movement to stop all this um, trafficking of children that's going on in Haiti. And so that, you know, with more knowledge and with the encouragement that they have, um, we can come together and stop it. So just one person made a difference, which was Megan, right? Um, Morgan. Morgan, yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm saying woman that just went down and imagine how many people could post. do it, you know, by just getting together. If we came together in unity. Yeah. Absolutely. That's really cool. That actually might be something that we could approach. You know how we were talking about maybe having a dress down mm -hmm. day? Mm -hmm. Using the money that we there. raised and said we're interested in this. Yeah. To the man that took my life, to the man who has all the power, let this surreptitiousness be known. Your brilliant ways, your apathy to lies you have taken are so incomprehensible to me. It takes me back to when I was scared of the boogeyman. But now I lie in the in-between of heaven and earth, and I won't get to the kingdom until I live in peace. So to the young boy who is being hurt and abused, to the children who are left without parents, to the young children who are left unfed, to the young girl who has been kidnapped, and to the children who also lie in the in-between, I will speak candidly and incessantly to the ones who hear my scream on the other side of earth. Let the anarchy of man be destroyed like a natural disaster. 
Let them know you are coming to change the rules, and that you are ready to explode like a ticking bomb. For the earth pleads indifference, but like the movement against racism, and just like unity helped make a difference then, unity now will live in deference to the ones who left without living in peace, to the ones who are trying to make it to the kingdom. Okay, and then these are just some more poems. I'll explain these ones after. On the television, another black boy shot and killed. Thoughts of some, that's no surprise. Thoughts of others, another one of ours taken. My thought, another angel being brought to a resting place. The sound of gasps, cries, and but mostly shattered hearts when the killer was found not guilty. For a moment, everything froze. That grin filled with evil and no sorrow when he was told you're free. A grin like one of a demon itself. That grin that would haunt Trayvon's family for eternity. That grin that shot an innocent child for reasons of just self-defense. Self-defense from a black hoodie, Skittles bag, and an Arizona. Self-defense from nothing. Self-defense from innocence. Young blood being spilled, dead angels whispering. All-out war between a family and a community. Battles being fought, candles being lit, a son being buried, and a killer running free. A look from mother to mother, no words being spoken, but every word being heard. I dislike this generation, I don't understand the human nature. Why must we cause each other such pain and then speak about the struggle of living each day? Hoping for a better future, but settling for reality. Finding peace before you rest in it. Another one of ours taken. Another mother, brother, cousin, father left depressed and emotionally vacant. Another one of ours taken. Forever silent. Shh, just a moment of silence. One thing that I cool about that one um is she, um, this, this student is Hispanic, and she was identifying with Trayvon in a, she was saying another one of ours because she was speaking about minorities, and um, it was powerful when she explained that and expressed that, um, because it's important for me to remember what her experience is. Um, Cold wind whistles around us. We stare like statues with gray bodies. I look around and there's an army of myself. We all look the same, walking skeletons with the same outfit. What happened, I thought. What do we do to deserve our brutal death? The sun is up. My eyes burn like the flames of a fire. My stomach feels like an iron is in it. I feel like a feather that the wind will take away at any second. I wish it would. I'd rather be anywhere else than here. I look around again. I see piles of me, ashes of me everywhere. Another like me stands in front. Work, a guard yelled. Does, he doesn't move. Gunshot. There goes another one. When will it be me, I ask. When will it be my time? It's dark. My body's solid, cold, and in pain. My bed isn't really a bed. It's a bed of corpses and wood, of bugs and dirt, of souls that are left behind. It's bright. I do my routine and work. My ration of food is just a piece of bread and a scoop of soup. We kill for this little ration. It's the only thing we have. When will it be my time? I'm weak, tired, dead. I breathe, everything hurts. When will it be my time? I breathe again, finally. Yeah, absolutely. I had the pleasure of taking Leanne's voices of students' voices to Vegas last year, if any of you were there. If not, everybody could make it. But um, there was just an amazing, um, people were more interested in that these were inner city Hartford students with so many different cultural backgrounds and, and the ELLs as well. Um, I just wondered if you could share a little bit about the movement and the, the in and out of your classroom and that flurry that, that appeared this year again. That yeah. You before. Yeah, and absolutely. You um, well, initially, Last year, the work that um, Sue took was from freshmen, and um, they just did a phenomenal job. They were talking about their own life um, in Hartford in their own city, um, and their enthusiasm was greater than the initial enthusiasm of my seniors. So uh, when I when I proposed this to them, there were about five kids, you know, like maybe two to one in each class that were like, "Yes, poetry," you know, but the rest of them were like. 
why? Like, they didn't understand. And they were actually very, some of them were opposed to it, to the point where they refused, about three of them refused to, to participate until the last minute. And not, not in a rude way, they just didn't see the point. Um, but all but two ended up being involved. Um, they all had sort of, especially hearing each other's work. So they, they, they all found a voice and found something to be invested in and something they wanted to document. And, and none of them really chose to write about themselves, which was an option. Um, and I thought that that was fascinating. I, and because the, the freshmen really only knew how to write about themselves. And it was really, it was special for me to see how over the four years of high school, um, the seniors do have a different development and awareness of the world. So as I had the more enthusiastic students finishing, I'd, I'd get them recorded as soon as I could and then go back in and, and share it with the, the classes. And that's really what built the momentum for the rest of the students to become invested. Um, and they were, they were responding to each other's poems and they were so proud of each other too. There was no, I mean, there was a clear objective understanding that some of the poetry was better poetry, but the cheers and the, the support was as uh, strong for each, for every single poem. Um, so that was really, that was heartwarming, especially after, after a difficult unit, as I said. It was very nice to see this, especially because they were sort of grumbling in a post at first. <laughs> it was really nice to have um, this opportunity um, and for the poetry to do exactly what I wanted it to do, which was get a, you know, get, create a, a stronger um, classroom. Um, I'd say the same thing happened in my seventh graders too, and these are kids, same thing, reluctance. I mean, they're in school in the summertime. <laughs> um, and, you know, as part of the Gear Up grant, we're, we're tracking these kids from seventh grade to twelfth grade, but it was at first they're like, what's this point? This is just poetry. Not even realizing, you know, so much of their, everything these kids do in their lives in their free time is poetry, whether it's, you know, part of the way that they move. I mean, it, um, the, the way that they move, the way that they talk, it's just, it's, there's, these kids just, live poetry every day. Um, and when they realized that and made that connection and, and were able to take that from a historic event and start, I love what you did with focusing in on internal rhyme and uh, repetition. I'm totally going to steal that because that's really, you know, even in the examples we hear, we hear things like writing in threes, things that we know as writers that we do all the time, and then internal rhyme and repetition in poetry. Um, and I think to make that explicit, was awesome because I got the same thing. It was like this reluctance at first, and it was my job. The kids that really like weren't just put their heads down on the desk and weren't going to work. Like, mm -hmm. oh, Mr. McCarry, can you can you come grab these kids? And, and I'd sit and take them to a room. They're like, all right, let's let's think about this. What you well, you know? What's what's a story? You know, what's something? What's something you could you know that happened in your life that you could maybe think about in the Civil War? They're writing about the Civil War, 9/11 usually, or Katrina. Those are the three topics that were really resonating with my seventh grade. And I did the exact same thing happened with your 12th graders. So it was really cool that that worked together. Yeah, it was the, yeah, definitely the movement was the same. Um, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, did you talk at all about um, reading and the importance of expression in reading? Was there, was there any interest in sort of? Oh, you mean them reading their poetry? Sort of like um, performance? That, that is, yes, individually with certain students. And you can hear in the recordings which ones, you know, those would be the kids who finished early and came to me during their lunch. And so, you know, the weeks leading up, um, most of my prep and most of my lunch was taken with this. So there was some individual um, work with that. Not so much class-wide, because it took the entire three weeks I allotted to get the drafting process. Um, to the point where it, it needed to be really for them, not not for my requirements, but for them to feel like they had written a poem. That was a complaint I heard a lot was, well, I wrote something, but it's not a poem yet. And that's why we went back to repetition. So even my, even a student who struggled with reading and maybe had a very low reading level, um, which of course translates to writing, suddenly wrote a profound piece because he was able to use repetition. Mm -hmm. So no, I focused more on the actual reading of the mentor text, um, what it meant to pull out meaning, that took a long time, and then the actual writing and what it meant to craft a poem. But, um, but I really was kind of itching to do that and we just didn't have the time to do it. I think we also talked about the arts are sort of our next step, sort of see how your students deal with the commenting. Yes. So in that case, if they know that's going to happen, and then what's better than reading your own poem? 
actually to learn how to read poetry. Right. But they're going to be going back and back at their own recording to make sure that they take in the comments of others mm -hmm. and re-recording. And I, I just love that from a literature standpoint, the fact that they're working with their own voice and their own words. And so it, it, it's the perfect thing. I think that was the element missing from my seventh graders the most. Their poems read like prose. Mm -hmm. um, and that was A, the age, and B, the time history. Mm -hmm. You know, we had, we're taking out, we have one, we have these little laptops, and they're going out in the hallway trying to record it really fast. And, they, you know, they're, they, and that was, I think, the element. But to me, that's form of assessment. I know what I need to work on. Mm -hmm. I need to get them to convert that prose into poetry. And I'm going to work on, well, let's interject this idea of repetition. Because when I did my small groups, I realized now that's what I was doing. Well, let's, Let's think, we went back to our mentor text, we're like, look, they keep using the same line over again. Let's break up your your talk with these elements of repetition. And then the example that I think, that was probably the best example I got from my students, but a lot of them are, read like their road paragraph. Mm -hmm. And we, we didn't have enough time to really go back and interject. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if there is, you know, is there a cognitive difference or are there differences in the way that a student would write if they're thinking about the performance part? Mm -hmm. Like, as they write, are they thinking about, this doesn't sound right. Like, if I were to, to verbalize this, you know, I mean, a lot of, uh, like Shakespeare, you know, there's other pieces that we know are supposed to be performed. Do this, does the student think differently about what is this going to sound like, like, really sound like when it's presented or performed? Well, I think also the social networking piece comes in there, because they know that whole notion of putting the identity out there on mm -hmm. Facebook or on whatever the newest thing. So this is the, here's my identity in poetry. So that, that piece is yeah. coming in as well. And I think front-loading that, that is important. I did not um, because, so, so I told them halfway through, they knew that I was bringing their poetry. And then I said, also, I, this is not part of your grade, but I really like it if you would record with me. Um, so they had already drafted pretty much to a final point when we talked about that. Um, and I'm, I struggle with whether or not I would want to front load that because there are so many kids that would just say, no, I'm not going to be part of that. Mm -hmm. This is stupid. I'm not, you, you've lost all my trust, you know, um, for my students anyway. There are two students who, well, one student I met two years ago on my first um, uh, interview in this school, and I was teaching um, a interview lesson, and I saw her, and I said, well, what do you think about this? And she said, she didn't even say, no, I will not answer your question. She just shook her head, no. She's been in my class for two years in a row, and she has never, she, she has brilliant thoughts. She will come up to me afterwards and say, I really appreciate what you brought up about that poem. Like, she's very thoughtful, but she will not speak in class. Um, and she is the one that we just heard about the Trayvon Martin um, case. So she was not going to read. I had another reader lined up because I really liked, I really wanted to bring her work. Um, and she finally said, yes, I do want to read. So, so that's something I'd focus on in the future, but we didn't do a lot of it. Yes? I have kind of a tough question. Um, so Carolyn Forche has been ex accused at times, I think she's a great poet, but being exploitative in terms of writing about such a matter that she doesn't really know very much about. Mm. And um, I'm kind of thinking, I just went to Detroit recently, and I'm, I'm from Boston. Anthony Bourdain just did this really interesting television show where he he either coined or referenced the concept of ruin porn. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, he had ruin porn, porn, porn throughout which it. Which is where you go and you look at sort of something that's mm -hmm. devastating um, as a chorus and, and, and you take something away from it without a real relationship with it. And I, I'm wondering, you know, when we give advice to writers or advice that I've received, writers, write what you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you respond to having, I mean, I just, I wonder about your kids writing about subject matter that is, that is pretty complex. I mean, mm -hmm. not necessarily the case of the young woman from Ghana or, you know, the kids writing out of their experience, but writing out of a not very in-depth engagement with subject matter that is very complex and mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. um, Are they are they exploiting the subject matter in a way? I know that's a tough question. Well, the but quote it's we had my, and it's on my mind. So I guess it's a great mind. question, though. Poetry came from a, a, a piece called "The Problem with Documentary Poetry," mm -hmm. and that was the argument that this is just—it's like clicktivism in a sense that you know you're not you're not doing there's no activism involved. You're just describing some horrible event with imagery. But 
as I, we'll post last year's presentation too when the kids were writing about Hartford and that you do like they capture some of that what they're bringing in but I see some benefit of why wouldn't I want to bring them into some moment in history to find some kind of lost voice why would I mean this idea that maybe they get they decide to learn more about a topic so but if, if a child does they may not know enough about human trafficking but if they go and find some information about human trafficking and mm -hmm. create this poem about that, and that sparks their idea that, you know what, I can, with my words, influence people and change the world, even if I don't know an in-depth topic about it, to, to jump this pose, to take that idea, your voice onto a narrator in some kind of different event, I don't see any problem with that. To me, that's, I think, my job as a teacher, to get them to, to consider multiple perspectives and voices. And to do that as a writer is even harder. So if I can get them to do that as writers, I'm okay. Well, I think, I mean, I would like for my students, you know, my pre-service teachers, my veteran teachers, and also, you know, previous students is, you know, straight up from Vygotsky, I would like them to step into somebody else's perspective in their life and try on different life choices. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to uh, be thoughtful and you know, critical of our students and critical of our own teaching practice and have them really think about what we're having them do. But, I mean, do you want to? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a difficult question. I think it's sort of a necessary question. I think it's, I don't think it's a new question either. I mean, it's the same thing that people have been asking since cameras were invented. Because that picture you take at that moment that documents a tragedy is worth so much money, but it's also worth, it has a lot of historical value as well. Um, so we actually discussed that, not in depth, because we didn't have a significant amount of time. But one thing I will say um, that I found sort of was a natural safeguard is that there was no assigned topic. So they had to choose the topic. Um, and also, there is no thrill for them to, for my students, to dwell on pain. It's not foreign to them. Suffering is not foreign to them. Um, I don't want to make that sound dramatic, but I mean, it's, it's true. Um, so they chose the things that, they, that resonated with them, um, and they did do their own research with that. But I do think it's important to have that discussion, to continue having that discussion, and to put supports in place around them. Um, and yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And they definitely were considering that as well. And I also, I think, you or no, you said something about activism. So I think also I think in, I think intention and then the next steps um, come into play. And so, for instance, the young woman who wrote about the Haitian children. I mean, we have a contact who is in. We we know Morgan, the the woman who is um, transitioning children out of these orphanages. Um, so they actually want to. The part we skipped over is a discussion about um, that the students came up with about having a fundraiser and giving the money directly to this organization. Um, and then they said, well, how do we know the money's going where we need it to go? I mean, they're asking those questions, so um, I, don't, I don't think it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing to assess and it's a difficult thing to provide support for, but I think it's a necessary question. So thank you. I love the activism I to part. Say that, um, I, I can't add to the end. She's my former student and she's shot ahead of me so far, but it's wonderful. But, um, I, I remember thinking about this question through Susan Sontag's work. Is that where it came from? If I'm remembering yeah. correctly. Um, and, uh, and, and journalism. And so when you mentioned, you know, that it's it's not new. It's from the, the beginning of when the camera came. You know, the, the, the um, what's the word? Um, sensationalist journalism. Sorry, I couldn't come out with it. Um, and I think it's so important to talk about. You know, are we are we sensationalizing other people's pain? And then I keep remembering that the ends there with real students who see it every day, and, and that's where I'm growing. So it's the difference between being an outsider to it versus an insider, maybe, that we're talking about, too. And so I think we need to keep that in the question. I, I really am glad that you brought that up, because it reminds me that you know, certain kids have a different sense of what that pain is. It's a foreign thing you read about in books and you hear about on the news versus um, seeing it. And I, I think this is one that maybe... Does anyone else have a here. viewpoint on that? Um, 
she didn't express anything that the actual kids who knew Trayvon Martin did. I'm from Santa Cruz, Florida. This was where that took place. Mm -hmm. And many of my students, um, I teach in an alternative high school in Santa Cruz. And many of my students were friends with Trayvon and he knew my students, um, knew his family. Um, and the sentiments, it was, you know, I was listening and it, I didn't hear anything that I would not have heard from my own students. It was very, to me, that was, that's the, the power of being able to reach and understanding because of taking a similarity in your own life and, and, and placing it there because you're a long way from Sanford. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but those were, you know, I had, we had a lot of students over the course of, you know, from, from the time that it occurred through the trial who, who expressed their feelings in so many ways, you know, through, through writing, through music, through anger, through frustration. And it, it was interesting to hear someone from, you know, of the same age, but from a different part of the country mm -hmm. to, to express it. It was, it was I, I wouldn't have known the difference. I could have taken my own students' words and place them up those words and not picked your student out. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, I think that that's, it's very authentic. It, it, I mean, it's, you don't have, I don't think you have to know the exact thing, but you know pain, you know loss, you know, I mean, I think that you can pull from your own experiences. You know, I've never lost my home in a hurricane, but I grew up in South Florida, so I know what a hurricane feels like. You know, I've, I've never lived through a flood, but I know, you know, what a fire's like in your home, so we, you take those things and you, 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 trans, you know, transport them or, or, or carry them over to the next thing. I, th I think that it can be genuine. Yeah, I'm just so so struck by, sorry, I'm just so struck that every year when we, right, we, right near the end of our presentation, we always start thinking about next year, and <laughs> I'm just hearing the social networking aspect of this, the, 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 the sounds in the cloud, the voices in the cloud, that could connect those mm -hmm. two populations. See the similarities and differences. That's what this is all about, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. what we had in mind. So it just seems like that's what our next step is. You know, what is it that we can know that's the same, and what is it that we can't? And if we really I'm also anything. all of a sudden like it's, it's jelling in my head. Sue and I worked with pre-service teachers. Well, I worked in seventh grade, but uh, with pre-service teachers, um, and it's no secret that our pre-service teachers are usually whiter and wealthier than the students that we teach. Um, and I'm thinking about the topics that are, you know, Edward Snowden, the Korean War. And I'm, I'm thinking about some other topics that my students pick compared to the students that the kids in New Haven and Hartford pick. And there's a difference. Ours almost are more disconnected or not, I mean, that's a disconnect is not the right word. Like I said, the idea is jelly in my head as I'm you know, speaking, um, which is never a good idea. Um, <laughs> but this idea that they're more removed and there isn't as much I, emotion and pain. You said something with my kids live, you look at tragedy, they live with struggle fit every day and you know so I think there's our poems from our pre-service teachers they seem more third person in their narrations um, versus you know the more kind of personalized tragedy I, that again is I'm, I'm saying this is coming out wrong because it's, I'm just starting to see that there, there is a difference in topical choices I think mm -hmm. between yeah. the students mm -hmm. and our pre-service teachers that. so that's something yeah, I don't want to look at now. Well, I mean, like, obviously we live in such a heavily mediated society mm -hmm. that we are exposed to the pain mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. others. Um, you know, I think, you know, obviously an example of Trayvon Martin, I don't think there's a minority teenager in this country that could feel exactly what they're supposed to be I think what, we're, what you're creating by asking them to do this is an experience. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, Compassion was the word that I thought of initially, but um, empathy is, of course, a step beyond that because it's coming into agreement with, um, and that is what I watched them enter into. And I got a lot of insight into their emotional makeup, which is so important to, to know when you're teaching. I mean, why should I ask for their time if I'm not going to invest in them? So, yeah, I think I saw that develop a, um, a little bit, and it's a foundation for where we're going to go. So thank you for bringing that word up. I don't necessarily want to answer this, but Chris, on the same thing, we were working with having uh, we, uh, South Bronx exchange with a video for the weekend um, in India. And many of our people in South Bronx suddenly say, Oh, I thought I used to think I was poor. <laughs> yes. But in that moment, there are also other struggling. 
right? So your white, right, middle class, upper middle class, who's your teachers, right, are, are then, and it's true for our idea as well, meaning who are the, we, we then define who, what is struggle, who, who the other struggle, as a, as a, and then it's like pity, pity those who struggle. And I, and I, and I keep, so we've been struggling with that, mm -hmm. right? So on one end, um, we are, we are, Helping us reframe and think through other perspectives, but at the same time, we're then continually out pushing out this other minorities. So I think we have time for like one last question. We have a couple questions left over. Um, a question with regard to using sort of the sound versus I'm the reader of things you can do, mm -hmm. one of which might be just a technical answer, which is we don't want to put really, but um, was it a very deliberate choice to focus directly on the sound of? Yeah, two years ago we decided, you know, we had all this visual content, the, multi, the the images and video. We wanted to try and figure out a way to use technology as a as a device to limit expression. So we wanted the students to focus on, you know, the text and then the the oral tradition. Um, and so that one of the things I'm thinking now is, you know, could we, you know, are we having this dialogue? because we're able to gather like the visceral quality of what these kids did because we can hear their voices. You know, can we, yeah, and that's what I want to know. You said earlier the, the applause. Did you let them hear each other's oh, work? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's when it took off because um, I needed their help in order to do this. So I brought, I brought in their work, the kids who were engaged, you know, and who were already, already had a thousand poems and then they were excited for a new topic, you know, because that's what they do at home. I brought those in, the kids started listening, the other students, and then they did get involved by the last day, which was yesterday. Um, <laughs> my entire lunch period, my entire prep, and I had to skip hall duty because I had students, I, I skipped a staff luncheon because I had students in my classroom the, the whole time, um, passes from other teachers. They were reading their work in other teachers' classrooms and making their teachers cry, which was like, then it became like they were proud of themselves if they could make their teachers cry. But it, it became kind of a school-wide thing, or at least a grade-wide thing. Um, and uh, so I watched that, that um, they, they overcame the resistance. At first, they want to be anonymous a lot. Um, but they're also at that strange age where they're starting to step into themselves, so they want to be heard. So this was their kind of platform to be anonymous, but know that their voice was being heard. Um, so it was difficult at first, but then their reaction, they came flowing in.